Hey everyone, this is Cobain the Christian. Today I want to test drive the kind of form of video that I was talking about the other day in terms of short answers to comment questions. It's not going to be strictly within that category. Uh, uh, it may be a little longer than three minutes, but I do want it to be relatively brief because it's a common question that I think can be easily answered. Before I get into the substance of that, I do want to remind you that I do have a Patreon. If you are interested in the kind of content that I produce and uh, and hope that it can be produced on a regular basis in the long term. Uh, your contribution to my Patreon on a monthly basis would be very much appreciated and it would be very helpful. Uh, that will also help uh, compensate those who are assisting with the increase in production quality that I hope to see going forward on this channel. Uh, for that reason, I'm also including ads. So if there's widespread protest to advertisements, I can consider demonetizing some of the videos, but that's why. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is the Tree of Knowledge. Now, the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil is often considered by many people to be kind of very obscure. Um, it's almost a bizarre story. The meaning of knowledge of good and evil is considered obscure, bizarre, and so many different interpretations compete with each other that many people just give up and say at the end of the day, we have no idea what's going on here. But I want to suggest to you that following James Jordan, it's actually not that difficult at all to understand what exactly the tree of knowledge of good and evil is. And in order to understand what the tree of knowledge is, we simply have to ask the question, where else in scripture is this language of knowledge of good and evil used? And if it is used elsewhere in scripture, is it used in any kind of consistent pattern? Well, there are several texts that I want to point you to. The first text I want to point you to comes in 1 Kings chapter 3. And this is where King Solomon asks God for the wisdom to discern between good and evil. In context, this is about kingship. Solomon has uh, recently come to inherit the throne. He has a very heavy burden on his back that he, ha he has to manage the whole kingdom. And there are all sorts of decisions that are going to be involved in that, which he has no direct experience with. He's going to have to judge between one uh, person and another in life and death situations. And the knowledge of good and evil in this context is the knowledge that it is necessary for him to govern as a good king. The wisdom to discern between good and evil. And note in Genesis chapter 3, Eve sees that the tree of knowledge is good to make one wise. Now it's not the same Hebrew word here, but the concept is still very much the same. We're dealing with questions of wisdom, and knowledge of good and evil has to do with the government of things. It has to do with managing the creation. Now note that in Genesis chapter 1, God not only gives man a nature, that is a nature which is fruitful and multiply and extends to cover the earth, he also gives man a task, go forth and subdue the earth. The word for subdue is also the word for conquer, and yet in biblical terms, the concept of conquest does not just have to do with bloodshed. In fact, we see in the history of Israel, Israel twice defeats their enemies by uh, fighting them in battle with agricultural tools. And then in the prophetic books, we see phrases like, the nations will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. In Zechariah, we read that the tool maker will ultimately conquer and subdue the four horns which subjugated Israel. And in context, four horns refers to four horns of an idolatrous altar. And we see then that the restructuring, the transformation of the world through tools as an instrument has genuine significance to the vocation of man in the world. Think about what it means to rule over a particular plot of land. It means that you have the ability, you have the right to change things as you see fit. Now, you can do that with your bare hands, but if you have a tool, if you have a computer, or even if you have a hammer, you can do things m with much more precision, uh, uh, and you can extend your energies in a much more productive and efficient way. So what is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And why knowledge of good and evil? What does that mean in context? Well, good has a, con has a context already in Scripture. We should always be thinking cumulatively in biblical theology. We should be asking the question, where does this phrase or word appear preceding this text? 
One example, which I, I really like because you know it's so in your face when you see it, is be fruitful and multiply. Now, that's such a common phrase that we, we've ceased to actually notice that it's a metaphor, but it is a metaphor. And it is a reference, it is an echo to the activity of God on the third creation day. God creates fruit trees, fruit bearing fruit. The seeds of those trees and the plants which have seed in them are created. So is it any accident that later in scripture when we read about man, we see man signified in terms of a fruit tree. A good tree doesn't bear bad fruit, says Jesus. In the book of Judges, good and bad kings, note the theme of kingship and rule, are described in terms of trees and in terms of bushes. And like in terms of seeds, we have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. At altars, sacred trees are planted. We read about the seed of Abraham and so on and so forth. This is an example that I'm giving to show you the importance of reading cumulatively one chapter on top of other chapters. So think about goodness. Where has goodness been used before? Well, Genesis 1, God saw that it was good. Now this is very significant actually, more significant than you might think at first, because the language of sight is not used accidentally. The Holy Spirit does not waste his breath, as James Jordan says. There is a reason why things are worded in the way that they are. Uh, again and again we read that God created something, he names it, he saw that it was good. He sees it, in other words, he apprehends its qualities. He sees that it is good. And good is relative to his ultimate divine purpose, the ultimate archetype, which uh, shows kind of in blueprint form what the creation ought to be. Now, I'm not just making this up off the top of my head. Look at the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, when Moses sees the form of the Lord, that's what number says, when Moses saw the form of the Lord, when Moses encounters the divine presence and comes to know him according to his name, that is, according to his genuine character, God says, I will make my goodness pass before you. And what do you see in this very context? Exodus chapter 25 to 31, God shows Moses a very precise blueprint of the tabernacle. The tabernacle is given in seven speeches, and they correspond thematically to the seven days of creation. You have the lights in the tabernacle, for example, on the, in the fourth speech. You have, you have discussions about the Sabbath and Sabbath laws in the seventh speech. You have discussions about priests who are given the spirit in order to construct the tabernacle concretely in the sixth speech, corresponding to the sixth day of creation with Adam having the breath or the spirit of life in him. Uh, so the blueprint that Moses has shown on Mount Sinai is the blueprint of the whole creation. And what Moses sees is the goodness of the Lord. The goodness of the Lord in its name. I will make, I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. God is telling Moses exactly who he is, what he is all about. And we read in the scriptures that the central sanctuary is the place where God sets his name. That is where his character is manifest. And his character is what gives the creation its structure. What does it have to do with goodness? I will make all my goodness pass before you. The goodness of the Lord is the archetype of the creation. And as I just alluded to, uh, in terms of the sixth speech on the blueprint for the tabernacle, it is mankind who is invited to complete the work of creation with God. God says, be fruitful and multiply, go and subdue the earth. We know from the rest of biblical theology that one of the modes of this subduction is through tools. Through tools, man can practically exercise his authority. God has created man in a particular relationship with the world. He has given man the ability to shape and restructure the world. And the how of that restructuring is facilitated concretely through advanced tool making. Through tool making, man can restructure what was previously just rocks and dirt into something which is going to fly into deep heaven, something which will actually go past the moon. It's remarkable the kinds of things that people can do when they restructure rocks. People wonder at human ingenuity at this. It's, it's as, if a, as if a kid uh, congratulated himself for putting together a Lego set uh, in correspondence with the instructions. Yes, it is amazing the kinds of things that human beings can do, but the creation was made for that purpose. It was made in order to be restructured. And goodness has everything to do with what is a good restructuring and what is a bad restructuring. 
So think about the way that we actually use the word goodness. Uh, we say that is good for this, you know, oh, this is good. What it means is it corresponds to the purpose that we are intending to realize. And so when you look at the six creation days, God sees that things are good because he is evaluating uh, as the sovereign of the world. He is evaluating the nature of things and he's saying this corresponds in its nature to my ultimate plan. Now, think about the language of sight throughout the scripture. Um, again and again when God is evaluating or when the biblical author is evaluating the behavior of the kings of Israel and Judah they did what was right or was wrong in the sight of the Lord what does it say about Adam and Eve after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil their eyes were opened how about in the book of Samuel when Jonathan accurately evaluates the situation right before the battle eating the honey it says his eyes became bright this is a major theme that we see throughout the scriptures when Jesus is revealed as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the book of Revelation. We read that he has eyes like a flame of fire because uh, eyes extend the presence of a person outwards in union which, with that thing which is known and it enables that thing to be taken into that person uh, intellectively and evaluated in relation to the particular archetype. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a tree which enables mankind to share in that divine vocation, in that divine uh, power to continue the work of creation. Uh, there's lots of other things that I could uh, say about this in relation to you know what the tree actually is. Uh, I'll try to keep it relatively short. Um, one way that you can see that this is actually what's going on is the fact that God gives Adam and Eve clothes right after they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When, you, when you've done what you, you've done, you can't go back. God can redeem it and he can make it good. Adam and Eve were naked. They saw what they really were once they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what were they? Unprepared. And that is why man has made such a terrific mess of things when he was given the capacity to restructure and reshape the creation. Having been given that ability, which he was always meant to have, but having been given that ability before its time, he restructured it in horrific ways. Ultimately, though, God redeems that by being crucified on the tree and granting us both bread and wine, wine corresponding to the eschatological fruit of glorification. So, and clothing is associated, even still today, with authority. You know, your, uh, the king will wear different clothes than the commoner. If you are in a corporate board meeting, uh, there will be certain signs on a person's clothing that they are a higher level of officer. Those may be as informal as wearing something super expensive, thereby signifying I have control over more stuff than you have control over. But in Genesis itself, we can see this. Noah, for example, uh, his when Ham commits his sin against Noah, rebels against his father, he attempts to expose his father's nakedness. Now, Noah is a glorified human being here. Noah does many things that God did. So God rests on the Sabbath, so also Noah rests inside his tent. God plants a garden, Noah plants a vineyard. God's son, Adam, rises up and rebels against him. Noah's son Ham rises up and rebels against him. God issues blessings, or God issues curses with the promise of blessing. Noah issues blessings and curses on his children. So again and again, we see correspondences between Genesis 2 and 3 and Genesis 9, but Noah takes the place of God because Noah has ascended to the authority to uh, exercise judgment over life and death. You know, uh, Noah uh, has the authority to carry out the death penalty. As I gave you the green things, so I give you everything. Noah is exalted because of his faithfulness. So I want to close out this video by talking about the story of Joseph, I think hopefully briefly, um, and the correspondences that the story of Joseph has with the tree of knowledge of good and evil and how this, court, and how this verifies um, the argument that I've made so far. 
Now, Joseph ultimately rules from a place in Egypt called the land of Goshen. So the land of Goshen is the best land in Egypt, according to the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 13, verse 10, we are told something very, very significant. And that is that uh, the land of Goshen is like the garden of the Lord. So we need to keep that in mind. This is part of reading cumulatively. Land of Goshen should remind us of the Garden of Eden. So Joseph, with his family, is restored to a land which is like the Garden of Eden. Now think of how the text, uh, think of how Joseph rounds out the book. He says to his brothers who are repenting, he says, you meant this for evil, but God meant this for good. Good and evil. If you don't think you should read that in light of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, consider how Pharaoh says that he's seeking a wise and discerning man. And once he finds Joseph, this wise and discerning man, he gives him a new name, a name which means life, just as the, uh, the, serp, uh, the head of the serpent who dealt death to the human race is promised to be crushed by the seed of the woman. Joseph is an anticipation of the seed because he brings life to the world. How does he do so? Well, he is invested with royal garments. I'm not going to make the argument that it was a coat of many colors here, though I think that that is probably true. But he's invested with royal garments, not unlawfully. He doesn't seize his authority ahead of time. He humbles himself. He only exercises authority when it has been lawfully granted to him. And whereas Adam and Eve attempted to seize life on their own terms, tried to take life for themselves and have authority when they wanted it and not when God was going to give it to them. Joseph humbles himself and then he is exalted. He's given a name meaning life and then he harvests bread from the world and saves the world and gives it life by feeding the nations with bread and wine. It says uh, all the face of the earth came to Joseph. Now this is actually an echo of the flood story. This phrase is used in the flood, it's used in the story of Joseph. Uh, you think of the motif, for example, the first judgment is by water, the last judgment is by fire. So a judgment by famine, a judgment by heat, it is a type of judgment by fire. And the similarities are as important as the contrast, or rather the contrasts are as important as the similarities. Because in the story of Noah, there is a remnant of the human race who is saved. It's just one family, Noah, his wife, and his children, and their wives. That's it. That's everybody who is saved. But in the story of Joseph, all the nations are fed by Joseph. We read at the end of the story of Noah that all the animals came out by families and God blessed them. Well, God then says a couple chapters later, all the families of the earth will be blessed in you, Abraham. So the idea of the church as this sacred space in which all the nations are incorporated, that is anticipated in terms of the literary um, techniques of Genesis. Uh, and Joseph doesn't just save his own family. He saves all the nations of the world together with his own family. So there's a, there is a contrast as well as a connection. But what is he ultimately saying when he says, uh, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good? How does this relate to the knowledge of good and evil in the way that I've described to you? Well, because knowledge of good and evil fundamentally has to do with the authority to exercise judgment as king. Their eyes are opened. When your eyes are opened, this is the opening of the vessel and instrument of judgment. You evaluate something and you evaluate whether it is suited to the purpose you want to realize in the world or not. It has to do with your capacity to exercise government. Well, what Joseph is doing is interpreting the way in which God governs the world. When he interprets dreams, what he's doing is he's looking at the symbolic qualities inherent in the archetypes present in these people's dreams. You know, it's not just an arbitrary act of prophecy. There's a difference between dictated prophecy and stuff that you get by wisdom. This is something which, under divine inspiration, Joseph gets by wisdom. He is able to see the dreams and see by intuition and by wisdom the actual meaning and quality of these dreams. And he is thus able to see ahead of time God's plan for governing the world. You know, God has like a plan that's written out. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to rule the world. Joseph's able to read that plan and ascend to rule together with God by reading of that plan, by learning wisdom through knowing that plan. 
So when he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, this is directly connected to the notion of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about the wisdom to discern between good and evil in the sense of the capacity to exercise judgment and authority as king. The capacity to bear the weight of the crown, which is on your head. And Joseph can bear the weight of that crown. He can restructure the form of Egyptian civilization. He can have authority to, uh, uh, to decide between life and death in the way that he does because he has observed the way in which God rules the world, both in terms of the fabric of symbols and in terms of like, the practical acts of God's providence. And he is able to imitate those as a consequence. And so Joseph has the knowledge to discern between good and evil. A couple other notes very briefly. In Isaiah 7, for example, you see the uh, famous prophecy of the uh, son who is given to, um, behold, a virgin or an alma, I've discussed that in another video, shall conceive and bear a son. Uh, you shall call his name Emmanuel, or God with us, God is with us. Uh, many people point to the following verses uh, as an attempt to prove that it's not about Jesus, that before the boy knows how to discern between good and evil or before the boy knows how to reject the evil and choose the good. This is technical language for the boy coming of age to rule as king. This is all about uh, the capacity of this child to serve as Israel's Messiah, which is the whole context, faithfulness to the house of David. Uh, in uh, the book of Samuel, another, another really interesting example, the angel of the Lord is said to have inside him the wisdom to discern between good and evil. Now, the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. So in the New Covenant, which is about the glorification of human beings, Christ is the head of the human race. He is the last Adam. In the Old Covenant, which is managed by angels, as Paul says in Galatians, and the Psalm 8 describes, for a little while we were made subject to the gods, uh, and then we are crowned with glory and honor. Well, in that order of things, the office which the Son of God, the Logos, inhabited was the angel of the Lord. And it is in him that exists the wisdom to discern between good and evil. Why? Because the Logos is the one through whom God rules the world. He has authority over the whole shebang. And so in him is the wisdom to discern between good and evil because the form of goodness itself is summed up in the person of the Son. So I hope you found that uh, uh, somewhat useful. You know, 22 minutes actually it is not, not too long by my standards. So. Uh, I hope you found that useful. Uh, if you enjoyed the content, if you want to keep seeing content like this, please do consider, if it's within your financial means, contributing to my Patreon. But all of your views are, of course, very much appreciated. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe and share this video if you liked it. Uh, I will see you again in a couple days.